I'm in school, so. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Now back to screen share. I'll do this one. This one, and I have to talk to myself in front of everybody. All right, I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> Give myself the best answers. Word. All right, so learn how to write about Black art with clarity and with confidence with Trelawney Michelle. <coughs> and Natasha. <laughs> All right, so a little bit about me personally. So I started off when I think about professional writing, I started off writing novels. Um, I was uh, in my senior year of my undergrad. I was also now one dispatcher and I remember just reading like three or four books in a row that to me was just sorry. And I was like, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I went out, I found some writing conferences and things to learn the process and how to get it to where it needed to be. And, um, and I did that. And so from there, people started asking me how to publish books, how to write books, how to do these things. Or can you do this for me? And I started doing that. And that's when I started leaning more towards a career in writing versus what I thought I wanted to do, which was law. Um, so I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design here for an MFA in writing. Um, and that was really uh, pivotal in making me write about different things. Um, yeah, and just expanding the way I, I write in general. And so from there, before then and even after then, so now I'm a ghost writer, um, mainly memoirs, autobiographies, self-help books. I'm also an editor, editor of Black Art in America most recently. Um, and I just put museum lover on there to keep it tied back into the art world, but all of the things. So maybe for me, and even to show through my example, particularly, is like, you don't have to have buku experience in this to be good at this. Like, I didn't even start going to museums, I don't think, until about 2010. Um, you know, but from there, so the fine art world took me back to the folk art to realizing like all the art, what all, how encompassing it is and how it's all around and all the things about it. And even then still, I didn't even think about writing about art until, um, working with Black Art in America, which started the beginning of last year. So doesn't matter where you are, you can still do this thing. Hello, I'm Natasha. I'm originally from Springfield, Massachusetts. I've spent most of my life in New York City, which I consider my real home in, in this country. Um, I am at the moment in Portland, Maine, a temporary situation where we're headed back to New York. I, art's been part of my life since early childhood. Um, it was an escape for me. Um, it was an indulgence. It was a form of creative expression. My dad, you know, would write, um, would um, teach me how to draw and we'd paint together. And I was very fortunate at the time um, when I was in public elementary school that there was funding for fine arts programs and then throughout junior high and high school as well. I was encouraged to go to art school, very specifically RISD, but I always believed that my appreciation for art far outweighed any talent or skill that I could possibly hone. So undergrad, I studied literature and I minored in studio art and art history. And then I became a journalist uh, accidentally. And I spent most of my career at the Associated Press as an editor on the national desk. And, in 2001, my dad was dying of cancer in, in Springfield and I was in New York. And um, after the 9-11 attacks, my world was imploding and I was um, you know, struggling to find some source of hope. And I approached Dolores Barclay, who was the arts editor at AP at the time. And AP has never had a designated fine arts writer. And I proposed writing about um, this particular exhibition uh, related to 911 um, photographs, both professional and personal. And from there, I, I started covering major museum and gallery openings for Dolores. And that was with a very specific style because AP is pretty strict. And then when I, I left AP, I continued to write about art um, for different publications, um, most notably Forbes, where I've been a contributor for a few years now, and Black Art in America. And um, it's 
really the most important part of my life, expressing my passion, sharing it with others, trying to get other people interested in art and recognizing that it's accessible, that this is not intended to be for the elite and we, we should all be embracing it. And it really improves the quality of all our lives. So I have 30 years of professional writing and editing, editing experience across you know, all <laughs> platforms, all subjects, but art is always my favorite. So building a little bit on you know, what I said about my own life experience, <clears throat> Art allows us to examine what it means to be human, to voice and express, and to bring people and ideas together. And by this, I mean all art. All art has value. Graffiti, sidewalk chalk art, community murals. It makes a difference in the way we live our lives. Seeing art, being around art, experiencing art. It helps us process our lives both individually and allows us to come together collectively. It enables us to communicate from afar. It generates positivity, appreciation, and hope. And, and that said, I mean that even with art that is not intended to be happy or convey happy ideas. It's, it's through the understanding that we can arrive at, you know, hopefully empathy. And uh, I'll get back to that in a minute with uh, another section. Um, you know, art criticism should explore how artwork captures emotions and feelings, especially affects and why they're indispensable to communication and understanding. But unfortunately, um, the term criticism, which Trelawney will get into is flawed. And we, we like to think of ourselves as art writers. Right, and one of the things when we were even talking, planning this workshop together, and that was one of the things like we immediately agreed on was just art writers because both of us, and so like, we don't even, if we agree that if we don't like it, we don't even write about it. And that kind of curve a whole lot of the, for what can be a barrier for a lot of people to even get started writing about anything really, but particularly about art too. If you're thinking about, you know, you don't feel like you're credible enough to disagree or to not like something and even to expound on why you don't like it. Or maybe you can't even expound on why you don't like it. It's just something and you don't like it. Like you don't even have to write about that thing. You can just only focus on a particular piece, um, a particular exhibit, um, a particular pieces and just write about the ones that do interest you and that gauge you because yeah, art writer can just be a more digestible, way to describe it because your language the language that you use it really determines you know how you how confident you go into it and whether you're willing to even pick up the label anyway you know and so yeah. at the end of the day so like art is about connecting right so if we think about why when a, when a piece do interest you or it engages you that's because it's something about it connected with you maybe it took you back to some kind of memory some kind of feeling you know it's always the feeling i cut you off natasha but i want to get that oh, piece oh, no. yeah absolutely i mean i agree a hundred percent and you know another thing that um Trelawney and i were talking about is the term specifically connecting as opposed to relating there's so many people like to say, oh, I don't like that because I don't relate to it or I can't relate to it. Oh, I like that because I relate to it. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that there's something in the artwork that resonates with you, that's familiar to you? And, you know, that's fine, but that's just a very basic, you know, observation or reaction. It doesn't solicit that more visceral response. And for me, connecting is about the visceral response. And to be clear, I see this both in works that are intended to be provocative, you know, works that use imagery, symbols, themes, uh, text, anything that is obviously trying to get people to think more deeply, to feel intensely. But I think that visceral response, the way we view art is up to us and we can find that in anything. And so it's about conjuring feelings and emotions that may obscure, overshadow reason. Mm. And 
that's one of the things that's really great about art is that it, it doesn't have to make sense and that emotion can bring us toward the real conversation. So for me, um, the reason why the visceral experience is important is because you can't ignore it, you can't dismiss it. In visual art, you know, this term is often associated with brazen imagery, representation, whether it's representational, figurative, or abstract, you know, symbolism, colors, but it, it doesn't have to be that. And a lot of times, you know, works that appear to be, you know, vibrant and joyful have, you know, a very, um, you know, dark and, and deeper meaning. And very importantly, viewing art isn't a passive experience because we're engaging in a dialogue with the works and we experience an array of, we, we may even experience an array of physical responses. We might cry, we might gasp, sweat, you know, I mean, there's, there's so much. And I think that's part of the richness of the experience. And, you know, I often observe, especially when I go back to an exhibition a second time after I was there for the press preview or, you know, through a private walkthrough, and I focus on the people who are seeing it for the first time and their reactions and how some people cringe or look away or cough or display other signs of nervousness or uneasiness that they can't conceal, you know, and um, it's, it's, I see all the time, like, it, for example, at the Dawood Bay exhibition at the Whitney, there were so many folks who suddenly had very urgent, you know, messages on their iPhone and were preoccupied with that because, you know, they just couldn't look, they just couldn't face this. It was too much. Um, to distract themselves. Yeah, and, and trying to make it look like they're not put off by what they're looking at, but that, that something is more important in their lives. You know, they are not connecting at all. They're disconnecting. And I think these kind of reactions draw us closer to the work. You know, they deepen our gaze. They compel us to confront new ideas and perspectives. They force us to think about ourselves, um, which is really important because in order to connect, it's you know both about understanding what you're looking at and who and what you're in dialogue with, but also you know what what you're saying, what you're bringing to the conversation. Um, and you know it's very important that we're transcending our biases. This is one of the best things about art you know, through this experience, particularly through, you know, visceral experiences where we can go from our emotions and, and these experiences and try to work toward empathy. And it's only once we reach that empathic level that we can really do anything that is meaningful, anything that can possibly, you know, uh, affect social change. And, uh, you know, you can't have empathy without that connection. It's just, it's not possible. Right. And, when you were talking about the distractions, like the cell phones, that even made me think about my cell phones for, um, for a second. Because now, like, we're so, you know, um, in, we're so inclined to pick up our phone and take a picture or take a video of it and not even realizing how that can be that so quickly just obstructing you know what I'm saying what we're feeling because we don't want to feel this in this moment or it just came out of nowhere we weren't expecting it and so to protect ourselves from that seemingly what we think we're doing you know you just pull something out or pull that phone out distract yourself or scroll through social media real quick or anything and that just makes me think too yeah like I remember the last exhibit that I went to which was uh Dor Doreen Lynette Garner's and it's here in Savannah. And I remember like, I went through it one time, I had to go back a second time, even by myself. Mm. And I think in just experiencing it again and for myself alone compared to with people, because both experiences gave me something different that did like deepen the level of connections. So I'm glad you pointed that out about, um, about him and the phones. And I'm yeah. sorry for interrupting, yeah. No, no, not at all. And you know, I, I think the best writers help us make that connection. And I think the way, in the most effective way is to really describe the works, to really get granular with it. You know, it doesn't have to be necessarily your response, your emotional response. I mean, I, I do embrace that kind of writing, um, but you know, it's just giving 
readers the experience of being there, trying to draw them in, making them part of the experience, because that's what's going to encourage people to go out and see art on their own. Otherwise, it's just, you know, a flat representation of something that is really hard to project through, you know, JPEGs on a handheld device or your laptop. So, you know, by bringing in that emotional, that visceral, we can really encourage other people to participate in the art world. Yeah. So here, here's an example that I found of a piece called Monumental. Um, so it's by Robert Pruitt. And so at the top, you'll see mm -hmm. a very basic description of it. It is basic in the sense of it's telling you what it is and no more. Robert Pruitt created an artwork of a woman with a map of redlining neighborhoods on her head to depict Ta-Nehisi Coates. So that's exactly what we see. We see a woman with a map on her head. So it's not wrong, but then just to show you, now this is from the, uh, the artist himself. So it's almost not fair for me to use this example, but I was picking something kind of fast. But the lone woman's dress recalls American antebellum fashion. Her head cover, a large colorful property map, references redlining maps used in 20th century discriminatory housing practice. I have attempted to emulate Coates' spirit of clarity through my approach and references to the ideas of home, property, and architecture. So, but even if this wasn't written by the artist himself, of course, but you still can take it out and kind of see what he did there, pick it apart. So like even the lone woman's dress. Well, for one, someone else might've noticed that on their own had they been writing it. Had I ha had this um, experience alone with this artwork and I was writing about it with no other reference, including a, muse a museum tour, which I always recommend everybody getting as much as they can when engaging with the exhibit for a first time, but the lone woman. So it's like her being by herself. Now, something else I really love about even art dialogue, because everybody gets something completely different from it. Um, and that's the beautiful part about writing it too, right? Because it's one big puzzle and we're just all putting our little pieces together to, you know, create this narrative that we all live by, and want to live by included. Um, so this lone woman's dress recalls American antebellum fashion. So now we have those two words that goes to a certain era that's going to mean something completely different for who you are. But for the most part, that word antebellum, as we all know, is going to take us to the word slavery, right? So it's like you're back into, um, somebody has something to say? Oh, okay. I don't know how to mute everybody right now, my bad. <laughs> and so her head cover, so we see that it's a large colorful, so now they're even giving us color with it, it's colorful, almost like when you're using your words, you always want to describe it as if a blind person is wanting to experience this through what you're saying. So it's like, you know, referencing redlining maps and then kind of get into like some educating. You, now you're telling us what, what that is, the redlining neighborhoods, what is that? because all of those, that explanation, just that little bit of context. And I didn't need to go sentences long or paragraphs long and explaining what redlining is, just redlining maps using 20th century discriminatory housing practices. I have attempted to emulate Coates' spirit of clarity. So because this piece is named after Ta-Nehisi Coates, it's like, and what do, if you are familiar with him, because that's, that goes to another thing, which we're gonna talk about um, in a couple of slides later, that research for context. Because you're really, that's really, really, really what's going to give you the meat in that, of, you know, of the piece that you're writing, whether that's a piece for Instagram or for Facebook. So if that's a little bitty caption for some artwork that you just want to share and write about in a space that feels safe for your own, you know, that's, that's equally valuable. And what, or you want to write some pieces for a blog, some long form pieces, or you want to write some pieces and send them off to be, you know, shared on someone's, someone else's platform that research for context. Um, and so, yeah, so going into that, so Ta-Nehisi Coates, so you'll probably need to do some research on him to see what he might've had to do with this. Because when, when I immediately looked at this, he didn't come to mind for me. But then when I read this, I, I understood it better. Okay, and that's basically what we're doing for people, helping them make that connection, which you can't understand something if you don't connect to it. I think it's great that you actually chose Robert's description because it speaks to another reason why we really need thoughtful art writers who are clearly communicating and in fact advocating for the artists by describing their work and contextualizing it. Because now artists, you know, contemporary artists are all 
forced to write about their own work. They had not only have to give artist statements, but you know, galleries and um, institutions and universities, they require this. And not everybody who is a skilled visual artist is a skilled writer and they don't all feel comfortable doing that. And also, I don't like writing about myself. I write bios about all kinds of people, artists, people in all kinds of industries and I enjoy it. Um, but I, I hate writing bios about myself. So I, I can completely empathize with the artists who are uncomfortable with that. And I think this is why it's so essential that we have writers who are really looking at the work thoughtfully, carefully, bringing in the context Ooh. and helping even the artist themselves understand why this is important, why this is relevant, how they can help to communicate their own work to others. And, you know, I, I mean, I've had artists who've asked me, you know, like, oh, there's something you wrote, you know, is it okay if I use that, you know, on my website or my bio? I'm like, of course. I, you know, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, honored by that because I feel like I did connect with their work and I saw something there that that is meaningful even to them. So I, I thought about choosing um, a more contemporary work, but I went with um, this because I think we've, we've all probably seen this image, if not in an exhibition, but, you know, in a story or uh, somewhere else in, in a book or, um, you know, maybe even a documentary. And I think it's just a really important work because <laughs> it's 1967 and it has to do with a very specific, you know, incident in history, but, you know, it certainly is timely now. There is nothing about it that, you know, is just trapped in the past. So, one person writes, the 144 by 72 inch oil canvas resembles Pablo Picasso's iconic anti-Spanish war painting, Guernica. Dai tells a similar story of the 1960s race riots in the US. Okay, sure. Um, those are the dimensions. <laughs> those are the materials she used. Um, but you know that usually is going to appear in the caption for the image, which, you know, I included here, um, you know, and that's something that you always want to do when you're writing about art is to, you know, have the artist's name, the title of the work, the year it was executed, the medium, the size, and also, you know, um, any credits, like if it's in a museum collection or a private collection. And I, one thing that's very important to me is to always ask if a photographer deserves credit for that work because that's art too. Um, so, you know, repeating the dimensions here, I mean, I would say, you know, something like monumental or colossal instead, um, but moreover, you know, resembles Pablo Picasso's painting. Well, I mean, we know what, what Faith was doing here, you know, and, you know, it is borrowing and it is advancing art history and, and there's just so much more to that that, you know, suggesting it resembles it, it's almost like, oh, you know, it's just a coincidence. Um, and, you know, telling a similar story, what if I don't know about the Spanish war? What if I don't know what Picasso was talking about? You know, also his work was a commission. Her work is fiercely independent. Um, so then we have another writer. Uh, the American People series number 20 die 1967 is Ringgold's response to what is known as the long hot summer when violent race riots erupted across the country. Bodies both black and white, young and old fall against a blood spattered duotone grid in a mural sized painting created in conversation with Picasso's Guernica. There's so much more here, um, even without getting into the history of the riots you know, these adjectives, they, they give us a sense of like, you know, really the, the intensity of what was going on, you know, not just the political climate, but, you know, the actual physical climate and, and imagining that, imagining, you know, what that was like. I mean, it, it gives us so much in that one short sentence. And, 
you know, describing it mural sized and in conversation with Picasso is very important because, you know, mural sized paintings are, are very much, you know, there for us to examine really carefully to get close to, you know, how they're hung is important, you know, where our eye level meets and, you know, using terms like splattered is important because it, it forces the reader to think more about what's really going on. You know, there's, there's so much energy in this painting. There's so much movement. There's so much going on. You know, it's really just, you know, a, a masterpiece. And, um, you know, simply to tell us how big it is and that it resembles a famous painting by Picasso, it does absolutely nothing. You know, and, you know, this is a time when, you know, artists, all artists, women artists were told by many people that, you know, they should be painting like Picasso. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's important to really note that Faith was making a conscious decision here to engage with his work, to create this dialogue, this conversation. I searched the slide for you. You want me to go with checklist one or were you going to do oh, that one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. I told you last minute, but I switched it. This is yours. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Okay. So building on, you know, what I was saying before, you know, convey not meaning, but feeling in context. So, you know, meaning, well, I, I mean, who, who are we to say what a painting means or a sculpture means or a collage means? Sometimes the artist themselves will say that, you know, sometimes there are markers in the work itself that make it very clear that this is a political statement or a social statement or a personal statement. And sometimes, you know, they write or speak extensively in public forums and books and interviews about what the meaning is, and that's fine. If the artist wants to tell us and we have that information, including it is great, but you know, it, I don't feel it is my place to tell anyone what a work of art means, but how it makes me feel or how it presents images and symbols and brush strokes and colors and movement and energy. And, you know, moreover, I mean, you know, artwork you know, large scale artwork has sound, it has vibrations, there's so much going on. All of this, you know, provokes us, it, it creates feelings and that's very important. And, you know, it's another way of drawing people into your reading, into the work and getting them interested in going out and seeing this for themselves because, you know, unfortunately most, you know, representations, you know, in print or digital mediums, you know, don't effectively convey that feeling because of textures, because of brush strokes, because of, you know, materials, whatever it is, it's, it's up to us to really describe that, to get granular, to get the readers understanding what they're looking at and context. I mean, that's essential. Like, you know, Trelawney says like, if you don't, you know, you can't assume that everybody who's reading knows all the references, whether they're references to other important figures, in the art world, in politics, in history, um, and, or events, we, we have to at least explain them, you know, basically. And, you know, how much explaining you do, of course, depends on your audience. I mean, if you are writing for a targeted publication, um, <clears throat> then you don't need that much exposition. But if you're writing more for a general audience, then you do need more. It's important. And, you know, you need to do research, you know, don't assume anything when you have the opportunity to speak with the artist, ask them, ask them what this is, you know, what it is, what they're saying, you know, they may say, I don't want people to, um, you know, think what I'm thinking, I want them to feel their own thing. Some artists will say specifically, no, this is about this, and that's important. And, you know, if we can't convey that, we can at least put their work in context with other things, with art history, with history, with social movements, with, you know, anything that's going on. 
And this research is so important. You know, when when we encounter something, when whenever I'm interviewing, you know, an artist or I'm getting a tour from, you know, a curator or a gallery director or whoever, and they say something like, you know, they make some reference and I don't know what they mean. I immediately ask them, like, can you spell that word? And I write it down and I make sure I have that spelling correctly and I mark it in my notes so that when I go back to my desk, I know that I have to research this. I mean, not, not every one of these details is going to end up in the story, but it's important to really examine all those details to ask the questions, you know, either in a live experience or on your own and, you know, never to write anything that you don't understand, you know, whether it's a word um, that someone else uses and you can't explain, choose another word. Or, you know, if it's, you know, a concept that's, you know, difficult for you to contextualize, difficult for you to put into, you know, art historical, you know, context, just don't do that, you know, work around it, use, you know, simpler language or clearer language, you know, as, as Trelawney said earlier, like, be confident with what you're saying. And that confident co confidence comes from doing your research, asking the questions, being a thoughtful observer, examining, investigating. And it's, you know, going back to what I was saying about how you describe the work and the feeling of the work, it's really important to say how big something is, what materials were used, you know, the year it was created. These are all very important things because, you know, if you're looking at a very small painting or sculpture or mixed media work in person, I mean, you have to get really close to it and you're engaging at this very intimate level and you're seeing things, you know, really close up. And, you know, if it's a giant, if it's a mural or a monumental work, you know, you need to spend more time, you know, maybe examining sections of it as close as you can get, stepping away from it. I also with, with works that either really um, evoke a powerful emotional response or confuse me, I always go back you know, within that visit, if I can, and, you know, within another visit, if, if I can, to, you know, examine it further and, and think about what I'm really looking at, instead of, you know, assuming that, oh, I just didn't understand it, or you're not supposed to understand it. Um, you know, the year is important, not only in terms of an artist's career, but in terms of history, social history, political history, personal history. And again, I always ask, if a photographer should be credited, because that's art as well. Photographing artwork is very difficult. I mean, we all know this from trying to take a picture at an exhibition and, you know, we don't get the color right, they can't get the, can't frame it correctly. I mean, that's, that, that really is an art of its own. Part two, I was muted, but I was laughing about the part of trying to take pictures in a museum and I thought really thought it was just me. Like, it's not straight. why can't I get it straight? <laughs> but uh, the second part of the checklist to make sure that your word choice, your word choice is intentional. Um, so instead of telling me something like um, it's, it's beautiful, because I see that a lot, um, pieces that are submitted and they say like, the exhibit was amazing. It's, and it's not to say don't use those words at all. Don't use those words at all. But if you do either um, let that be the beginning of now you're about to expound on it and, and show me what, how it's beautiful or you'll end it that way. So you'll do all the describing of how you walked in. There was a dark room and maybe a light was illuminating the one piece and it was encaged in these steel rods and it was a, 40 feet sharp, 40 foot sharp, and the insides, it was sliced inside. And then when you walk in close and you can see the jewels from it kind of, you know, shining and glistening in, di in the different angles of the light and you get closer and, you know, so it's like, I told you, and then at the end I said, it was magnificent. So I didn't just tell you it was, mag it was magnificent. I left you alone, I showed you. And that's something that's um, called showing versus telling in the writing world. So you're telling me it's beautiful, but instead show me, or instead of telling me it was amazing or phenomenal, um, show me how it was so, or do both, tell me and show me. Um, 
So yeah, and then another one, oh, an example Natasha used earlier was with that blood splatter in the uh, Faith Ringo piece. And so that was another word that was really it's vivid. And so in an exercise that you can use, because when I taught, I taught English in high, for high schoolers and for college for a while. Um, and I would have them do haikus every now and then. So we would start off with free writing. So I was setting an alarm for like five minutes and I was like, just write about whatever. I'm not reading this. Nobody gonna read it behind you. Just write, don't, don't pick your pen up. That's the only rule with free writing. You can't pick your pen up, you can't scratch out what you wrote, just write, all right? And then when those five minutes are over and now you got like another 10 minutes or so to turn that into a haiku. A haiku, you know, is this Japanese poem has three lines, five, five syllables, seven syllables, then five syllables. What I like about it is that it forces you to get creative and to really dig into your into your brain to see like what words you know or what what other more vivid words can you use in place of what you would otherwise say because you're so limited with how many um syllables or you know how long you can go with it so maybe instead of saying angry i was forced to say red or something like that and so that same skill set that you get from that practice is like what's really valuable in the art world, particularly because we're talking about something so visual, something that's just so feeling based, period, regardless of what the um, the art genre is, whether it's music that you're writing about or the visual arts or dance, performing arts, whatever it is, um, you know, those that really vivid language um, is really what makes it engaging, what makes it pop, what makes people want to get out and um, and go see it and engage with the work. And really quick while I remember to, because I will forget, everybody can trust that on my memory. Um, someone asked the question through email about whether there's a difference between how you write about black art and how you write about non-black art. In my opinion, and Natasha's too, I asked her as well, um, is not, is no difference in terms of, I mean, unless there was another way that maybe you're present during the Q and A section, you can ask too, if there was, um, if there's another question you might have had around it particularly, but as a basis, no, you're right about them the same. And, um, but you might wanna be careful too in how you describe the artist. So an example being Mo Brooker and Natasha shared this with me as well, like he prefers to be known instead of saying a black artist, calling him a black artist, he wanna be known as an artist who is black if his race matters in the discussion. You know, so for some artists, like Natasha pointed out too, because he's been talking a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> um, some some artists want their identifications, their labels to be forward. You know, they want to be known as the black artist or a black woman artist or a woman artist or you know, same gender loving artist or however. Some people their identity is forward. You know, before there was some like, don't worry about all that. Just focus on my work focus on my creation so you know you can learn that through research i'm um, going back to that contextual research or sometimes you're fortunate enough where you can actually talk about the writers that you know and that's another plus too something that um yvonne who writes about uh writes for black art in america too she shared in one of her pieces about um the importance of writing about the artists most immediately around you, who you might not even be sure if the world at large likes their work, but you really do genuinely love their work, like you write about it. So you don't have to write about the big names that everyone already know and love. You can write about the art and of the artists right around you or that you say, you know, just you define what good art is and if it's good art to you if it resonates with you if it connects with you then that's a good one to write about um yeah so i think i handled that question now and then another point would be to sound like yourself so this is just coming from an editor standpoint period <laughs> or even um more hilariously we're seeing it as like a professor or a teacher like you're reading these papers and it's just like when people are trying to sound smart <laughs> it's like i talk to you every day so like i know how we engage but we're taught to right we're taught to you know do that for our success um, but that really doesn't work in more creative pieces, which this is art writing is um, more creative pieces. If you're writing a book about your life, it applies there too. You have a little bit of space to do some things differently, but for the most part, you, you know, it's okay to sound like yourself. To, um, if you use words like dope, like I do, like it was so dope, I'm gonna say that and then I'm explaining to you like what made it so dope. 
um, other things like that, you know, just keep yourself in it too. You know, you can still keep your rhythm, your style. If you already have a writing style that's used, that's uniquely yours, you can keep that up too. But another element of that too is knowing your audience. So a, a really powerful, the, the best, the biggest benefit of writing on your own platforms is that can't nobody tell you no. And if somebody like it or they don't, you know, it's no approval rejection process. You're just doing your own thing. And that's really a good place to start with it anyway, particularly if you probably if you're in the class and you want to learn about art writing to get some art experience going on. What I used to do back in the day was get go to a site. I don't even know if it's still up. Tumblr, T-U-M-B-L-R. And I was just going there. And that was like where I just practiced food writing at that time. Nobody, I didn't know, no, I didn't promote it. That was just where I held myself accountable to do it every day about one something, one kind of dish, you know, so you can find safe places where you can just get your practice on and just and because once you start, once you know your audience swinging back to that, because I will forget. Um, when I write for, for example, for Black Art in America, I have to know who our audience particularly is, the age range of our audience that most of our readers will be Black people. Um, and more, even more so Black women. So, so you're thinking about all of these things. Um, if I was writing in Savannah, Savannah, College, uh, Savannah State University, I'm sorry, that's an HBCU here in Savannah, right? So if I was writing it for their magazine or contributing something in their newsletter, then I might be able to relax a little bit. That's Generation Z. Um, they're all primarily, primarily young Black adults, right? mostly listen to rap, you know, the, the tone I can use, the language I can use is so different. So um, noticing your audience and particularly when you want to pitch pieces. So if you're writing things and you want it to go beyond your own sphere of ownership on this world wide web onto somebody else's platform, already knowing their audience and who they target when they um, write things, uh, pr promote things and things like that is really, really valuable and pitching your pieces because it might not, sometimes it eliminates where you pitch and where you don't. Um, but sometimes too, maybe it just, it can just tweak just a little bit, just a few words throughout the piece. Um, just really going, going at it from a different angle than you were because that's the thing, it's really no right or wrong. So even if I went back, can I talk quickly go back? When I went to the, the piece that I showed Monumental, oh, now I wanna go fast. Okay, this piece here, Monumental. So this was just one way to do it. So somebody else could have came at it a whole, a, a total different way and it'd be equally engaging or even more so engaging. There's so many different ways that you can um, write about it. And that somebody else might write about something that's um, even more different than that. And I'm gonna just stop clicking right now. But, um, and that's another thing too, that gives some people anxiety because I work with a lot of writers, period. And so, and a lot of them, they feel like, because the, the books that we read are usually the New York Times bestsellers. They're these, they're ones that already mastered the format of the formula of what has been mainstream to find a success. And we look at that and we think for ourselves like, mine ain't that good. <laughs> or you just read other people's thinking. You just think, oh, I like the way she did that. And or he did that, or they did that. This so, I, I love the way they, they, they express that. And then you go back to yours and you don't feel the same way about yours, but like the comparison, you know, that's another thing that has to go, you know, let that go. And just as long as you're practicing and you're getting it out there, like you're good. Like the checklist and pretty much everything we have here is everything that you need, is everything that you need for it. Just practice it. And when you visit the, the, visit the museums, I'm trying to remember all of the things I wanted to not forget to say. Um, see if you can get a tour um, from one of the curators or assistant curator, you know, or they have interns there. That really makes a major, I want to say too, simultaneously when I say working for Baya is when I, you know, gain an interest in writing more about art. But more so than that, I'm going to say when I've got my first tour around a new exhibit by a particular curator, that was really, um, you know, transformative for me in terms of understanding what I was looking at and what I was feeling. And even that understanding lended itself to other pieces and exhibits and museums that had nothing to do with the original one but that initial perspective it was just like a, a reference point it was just just opened some stuff up for me so now let's um let's see what time it is oh, yeah. I just um I just want to add one thing to that to so, um you know about the tours and about getting you know a a more personal experience even if you're just writing a blog or even if you know you have enough followers on you know whatever social platform where you know you write about art insert yourself as an art writer 
and approach the folks who have access to the curator or the artist if you can't reach them yourself and say, hi, I write about art. I'd like to come in tomorrow and you know see this and ask you know if you would like to see it during a time when there's not a crowd or outside the press preview, ask. Most of the time your request will be granted because these folks do want people to write about it. And you know, they don't just want the mainstream big name or art press. They understand that audiences come from everywhere and they do want, you know, fresh takes on this. So that's another part of the confidence. You know, you are an art writer if you write about art and you have a platform. So don't worry that you don't have a big following or that even you're not paid for it or that you don't work for you know a major publication you are still an art writer because you write about art um so i noticed oh, there's sorry um i noticed there's a couple questions about um uh die should we wait hold that to the end or should i just go back quickly now with those oh yeah let's go ahead and do those yeah, so um, yeah, these are great questions. And, and one of the main reasons why I chose this work is because um, I think a lot of people are familiar with it and have seen it. And, you know, also because there is a lot of scholarship out there and, you know, faith itself has, you know, has said a lot and written a lot about it. So, um, you know, um, Nakisha, I hear what you're saying. And this depends entirely on, you know, who you're writing for, what you're writing. Sure, yeah, sometimes, you know, you're under pressure by an editor or whatever platform you're using and, you know, you have, <laughs> you know, commodity of space. And absolutely, you know, then, yeah, you know, sometimes it, it has to be, you know, concise. But going back to what Trelawney was saying about word choice, think about that. You know, it's not just the accountability of the words you're using to ensure that they're really representing your ideas and what you're trying to convey, but also the economy of words. If you have fewer words, you know, choose powerful ones, choose meaningful ones to, you know, get more into that, that small space. But I, you know, I like to write more, <laughs> but, you know, I, I do write for platforms that allow that, but, you know, work within, you know, what, you know, what you're given and, um, you know, that's that's great. And, you know, if you can write clearly and concisely and still convey enough of that emotion, enough of that passion, that's wonderful. Um, so, and then um, Brunel, um, yeah, we, we do know that um, uh, Faith was um, in like consciously in conversation with Guernica because she um, visited it the MoMA many times. It was on long time uh, loan between 1939 and 1981. And, you know, she did in fact, you know, very meticulously study that work. And, you know, in fact, I, I believe she herself has said, I, I think I've heard in a documentary, I may have read it somewhere that, you know, she's using a lot of these, these conventions. She's borrowing them, she's subverting them. Um, you know, the, the way that the limbs are attached, the, the limbs are the lines, you know, she's using that as a stylistic technique to, you know, create, you know, the fluidity, the movement. Um, so is, is that dismissive of her artistic and intellectual and independence to compare it? Um, I, 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 I understand what you're asking in a, in a broader sense, you know, and sometimes people draw these comparisons and like, you know, they'll say, oh, this reminds me of, or this is like that. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking about, you know, these two different works and, and I don't see it. I mean, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a legitimate connection that someone else is making, but sometimes I'm like, I, I don't know, that's not what I see there. Um, and sometimes it, it is, um, you know, particularly with emerging and, early career or lesser known artists, sometimes it actually helps them. It amplifies them when they are put in the art historical context, when they are compared to someone who is regarded as a master. Um, and, you know, because in this case, specifically Faith herself is you know, in dialogue with Picasso, I do think it's important. I mean, do I think every story about this painting, every mention of this painting has to mention Picasso? Absolutely not. But do I think it's legitimate to mention it? Yes. Okay. 
Got it. Let me see another one here. Uh, museums are also often provide printed materials. Oh, okay, so yeah, so the museums, like sometimes next to the piece, they'll have something about the artist or about the artwork on display. But even then, I still, it was still just another level there, but I'm glad you mentioned that. I meant to say that too. We definitely read that. But just having that explanation to give you the artist's intentions a lot of times. If I want a writer from a certain, I want a writer from a certain publication to cover my show for their publication, what should I include in my pitch other than in other other than the generic press release? I'm in the middle of nowhere, but I would love to have a writer from NYC or Philly cover our exhibitions. Thank you. Um, so I th think that just goes back to relationship building. Um, so I see a lot of people get a lot of, um, you have both this people posting a lot of things in various Facebook groups. Um, in person is always um, a plus. Um, connecting with publications that you already respect, at least building a relationship with them and, and pitching to them sometimes to their editor or wh whomever is like operating um, the publication itself and reaching out to them and letting them know, you know, that happens a lot with Black Art in America. They might reach out to us at, on an admin level, say, hey, we have this opportunity. Do you have anyone available that can fly out? And they just go ahead and include the benefits that come with that. Is there pay attached to it? Um, are they covering the travel expenses? Uh, what all, you know, is included in the request to come? Uh, Natasha, is there anything you would add to that? Sure. So I only um, over the last couple of years started accepting press trips. And this is something that I'm allowed to do under the contract. Not all publications allow this. So, you know, make sure before you, you know, even answer an email offering you a press trip, you talk to the people who publish your work or pay you if, if that's okay. Um, but um, the um, important thing is you know, again, going back to the confidence, when you are offered anything, a press trip, you know, expenses covered, you know, make it very clear that you are willing to accept this. You are interested in seeing this exhibition, meeting this artist, the curator, going to this event, being part of this talk, what, whatever it is. Um, however, you are not promising coverage. Some will say, oh, you know, will you be publishing something in Black Art in America or will you be publishing something in Forbes? And sometimes like, I know definitely that yes, I will, but I certainly, you know, and then, you know, sometimes you get the question of, well, what, you know, what do you think the scope of your piece will be? Or what do you think the perspective will be? Or what do you think the theme will be? Like the whole reason you are inviting me <laughs> to experience this is so that I can figure that out. <laughs> if I already knew what I wanted to write about, there would be absolutely no point in my going there. Um, you know, and this goes back to, you know, to the feeling, to the context, you know, all of it. I mean, it's, you know, you don't know until you get to an exhibition or an event what's going to happen because it's not just about the pictures and the sculptures or the performances. It's, it's about everything around it, you know, the environment, how it's hung, how it's curated, who's there, what's the vibe, is there music, is how's the lighting? I mean, how are people, you know, around you behaving, including your hosts or, you know, curators? I mean, it, there's so many variables. So just make sure you stand your ground and, you know, you're firm about like, okay, yeah, I'd be happy to, you know, accept this trip or, you know, whatever offer, but you know, I cannot guarantee you coverage or I won't guarantee you coverage. So, you know, some, some, sometimes the host will say, oh, okay, well, you know, we need a promise of that. And, you know, that's fine. And, you know, I don't accept that trip if that's not what you want to do. But, um, you know, because of what's happened to publishing, you know, um, this is something that's now very, you know, commonplace, the whole, you know, they used to call them junkets and, you know, there's, you know, some people, you know, will speak to the ethics of this, but it, it's really just part of how the art world operates. If they like you as a writer, they want you to be part of the narrative that they build, you know, and, you know, galleries will include your work sometimes even in catalogs, sometimes, you know, on their websites, sometimes they won't pay you, sometimes it leads to other work, but, you know, there's still exposure for you. 
So you decide what your terms are and what is important to you. It's, you know, it, it's, not, it's not their call just because they're paying for some expenses. Right. Another one, and I'm gonna come back to the ones in the chat too, but another one from email was regarding um, art value, writing about how much an art piece is uh, valued on the, in the marketplace. And, uh, we both, in, in that particular instance, I think our both response to that was um, only when like, we're talking about an auction piece. But I love the way Natasha was talking about it because she was like, those typically aren't the most exciting pieces to probably write or read, well, depending. Um, but yeah, in general, like you really don't need to include. So along with we're just talking about the materials, um, the medium, um, the year, the author name and all those things, you don't need the value. You don't need it there in the caption of the image itself or even in your writing, unless, I mean, there was a split, a specific reason that you wanted to include it, which I can't immediately think of off the top of my head. Um, did you want to add anything to that one before we moved on to the next question? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, sometimes talking about the value can be harmful to the artist themselves because, you know, say if they're an emerging or, you know, early career artist and you put that their work is, you know, worth this much or, you know, this was their auction record, it, you know, can devalue them. Um, and, you know, moreover, um, uh, sometimes galleries or artists themselves will ask you to include a price. And this is because what they essentially are asking you to do is create their sales and marketing collateral. Here it is, it, you know, it appears like unbiased journalism or criticism or art writing, but you know, really here's the glossy high res photo. Here's a description of the work and oh, here's how you buy it. You know, just click on this link right now. Um, so, you know, think about that. I mean, when, you know, you're asked to include information, you know, what you're comfortable with. You're not obligated to include a sales price. And I, you know, not only think that it doesn't add value to most writing, but it can actually detract from, you know, the value of the writing because it, it it's commoditizing something where you're really trying to focus on that emotional, that visceral, that, you know, connecting with the work. Got it. The next one is from Raven. If you're an artist um, or aspiring artist, does this change your recommendation? And um, Raven was referring to the recommendation of like how to approach being an art writer. Um, to me, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it doesn't, it doesn't change the recommendation for how you do it. It actually, um, I would say more so to you know, learn lean into learning how to write about art and even improving, rather I should say, because you're already doing it inevitably. But um, improving how you do it is really beneficial to you for the same reason Natasha was just saying earlier about like so many artists are being forced to write about their own work, um, even if that's unfortunately so, or if that's not a skill set of the art skill set of the artist. But so for that reason um, of you know you will likely have to write about your own art at some point or you already have. I would say that that's even all the more reason, um, you know, to, yeah, to sharpen your, your iron of art writing. Natasha, was something you wanted to add to that one? Absolutely agree. And, you know, there's inherent value in an artist who writes about art because they understand what they're writing about. You know, I, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I've been practicing art, you know, at a, you know, enjoyment level all my life. Um, I have studied studio art and art history. I understand technical skill and mediums and I, that informs me as a writer because I know <laughs> what went into each of these works. And I know what the artists are talking about. Um, and, you know, I'm always interested in what artists are saying about other artists, other artwork, because they do have a more informed gaze. Absolutely. Um, How do you secure rights to use images of the artwork? Um, 
if you have access, like immediate access to the artist, you can ask the artist. You can ask if you're taking, if you're using a picture of a, something you took of in a gallery or museum or some space like that, um, ask them. Um, but generally, if you, uh, or even if you, you know, of course, if you found it from someone on social media, you share, uh, you got it from, the, from that particular person, that particular account. How else, I'm trying to think in our Black Art in America world, if we've ever bumped into something no, because we generally, even if we went back to the pictures that we, you know, she, uh, she shared the one of Faith Ringo, I shared the one um, of Robert Pruitt, or both of those, even the way that those are captioned, like, to given rights to use. But then it depends how you're using the images. There's so many questions with that that come up for that. How do you secure the rights to use images? Yeah, because it depends. Like, and I tell a lot of my writers that, too, because they want to include particular images in their book or something like that. If you're selling it, whatever you're, if you're selling something and it has someone else's property in there, um, you want to get explicit permission to do that because you could be sued for that because you're profiting from it and you can be considered profiting from their uh, work. So now if you look at like, if we look at Black Art in America, we're not charging you to read those articles. So that's not something that's considered, you know, for profit. So we can share you know, plat platforms like that. So if you're talking about your blog post and just using the images there, as long as you pretty much say where you got it from. And in the digital world, I've come across numerous times where I found a particular artwork only on one website from one particular gallery, but they do not. And they let you know they don't give permission. That was only the only one time I seen that happen, but they didn't give any permission. They explicitly said, you know, there's no permission to use it unless otherwise um, stated. Um, but for the most part, yes, fair use. What is your take on that, Natasha? Because I haven't really bumped into that any other way, any other issue. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends wildly on, you know, who, <laughs> who owns the uh, images. You know, major museums um, have a press section where you get your credentials, you know, really, if you just, you just email them if you don't know them and you say, hey, you know, I write for, you know, this art publication and I'd like access to these images and set up an account and then you're logged in and then you can just get them anytime you want, 2 a.m. You don't have to wait for somebody to, you know, send and approve it there and anything that's there is approved and they're very clearly will tell you what, you know, you need for the credentials, you know, what, what credit you need. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, and, you know, asking an artist is, is always great. Um, but um, when you run into the gallery thing, that's, um, uh, you sometimes with the larger galleries, there's certain images that they cannot share um, a, a photograph of, and that's because it's from a private collection or it's going to be sold. And, you know, there's a complicated, you know, business relationship there and, you know, like, okay, well, I guess I just can't use that work. But one workaround on that, a lot of times when it's an exhibition and they don't want to share one particular, or they say they can't share this one particular image, they are allowed to share install images that will have like more of a panoramic or, you know, a view of a wall and that work will be included. And you can say, you know, the work on the left is this and, you know, um, use that. Um, you know, I, it, it's just sometimes, you know, um, in most cases, um, the artist, the gallery, the museum are, are eager to share the images as long as, you know, you, you give the proper credit because, you know, it, it helps them have exposure as well. And, you know, also, you know, sometimes things are up for negotiation, you know, with galleries, you know, you can explain, you know, um, what you're doing, but you don't, you, you don't have to do that. So it, it really, there's not a policy. There's not one rule. It's it's um you know it varies wildly based on you know the the level of you know artwork and the source. Thank you for responding. Thank you. Of course. Will the recording of this session be on YouTube? It will be on YouTube. Um, and we already got that one. Yes, Auntie Faith is still with us. Um, how hard is it to get into international writers? I live in France and I think I might have an interesting perspective. I'm just not sure where to start. Um, I don't know. Natasha, you have anything on that one? Um, sorry, I didn't, I, the exact question, how, how do you get into it, writing internationally? Um, you mean 
if you are in one location, but you want to write for publications that, that are global or somewhere else? Is that, is that the question? Let's answer it that way. Um, you know, just like you would, um, you know, the same thing you would with, you know, a publication in your own, you know, country or geography where, you know, you're pitching, say, you know, write, write a compelling, you know, email or message to the portal or whatever, you know, social media, whatever contact, um, you know, they prefer and, you know, explain your perspective. Say, I, you know, I have this great perspective being in France and I would like to share this, you know, are you interested? And, you know, the, the more that you share, um, you know, again, this, this goes back to that, you know, intimacy, that connecting, you know, the more compelling it's going to be. And, you know, it's, it's going back also to what, you know, um, Trelawney said about knowing your audience and thinking about the publication and like, you know, you, do you think your voice is a good fit for that? Do you think that the audience is going to appreciate your voice? Then, you know, include that and make your voice known in that pitch and that, you know, um, introduction to the publication. Um, if there's a language barrier, um, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, that depends on whether the publication is in, in a different language than, um, you know, you write. I mean, if it's, you know, there, depending on the size and scope of the publication, there may be an opportunity for translation. I mean, it's all, you know, there's not one, one rule and it's all, you know, very dependent on, on each publication. So, you know, just try. Okay. Again, with the confidence. <laughs> Another one, um, I'm an editor of a black newspaper and would like to publish more about black art, but I find it difficult to find writers on black art. Do you have any suggestions for obtaining students that are aspiring art writers? We offer internships, but haven't received any requests to write about black art. Um, man, that, that sounds like, um, okay, well, two things come to mind. One, go to where they are. So like, if I think about one of the recent conferences, the final conference, um, the Black Fine Art Fair, when it was in Columbus, Ohio, last year, that was already last year. Um, so there, I was actually approached a few times there, like, hey, are you also operating as a freelance? You know, can you come and do some writing for us? So that's one way I see it being done a lot. Um, maybe even asking art schools, particularly, um, if that comes to mind. But then maybe to reconsider maybe how you are pitching the job or the opportunity, rather. Um, so maybe saying, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how exactly how you're worded in the promotion, but that might make a difference too, because it might sound like it's something where I needed 30 years of experience and I've written for a publication before. And I don't consider myself like, are you like, think of like, when I say like art critic, we, use, we like art writer instead of art critic, that same reason, like for the language. So like maybe go through and check the language that you're using and how you're um, trying to attract the writers because maybe, some, and maybe even too, let them know if you're open to it. I'm not sure what level of writing you prefer and what, you know, how much experience you prefer. But um, yeah, I don't know. I would say meet them where they are, try to find where they are. That's the, uh, those are the only places I can explicitly be and remember um, someone reaching out to me about, you know, if I write. That's the only place I could think of. What about you, Natasha? Um, yeah, I, I think that that's the right approach. Yeah. NFT, who I'm not even going to touch NFT. Um, <laughs> that's an entirely different workshop. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure it's a lot of them out there. We might have one coming soon too. That's been in conversation with us um, behind the scenes. Sorry, NFT isn't for writing, it's for art right now. Um, I just read that comment. Are there books you would recommend that would help with, create, uh, help with creatively about art, help, I guess, writing creatively about art? for others or yourself, if you are the artist, any books to recommend? I can't think of any, even, um, and that was another thing we had talked about going through college, taking all these art history classes and having to write about art, but never really taught about the process itself. Um, I don't think, maybe instead of looking for it, look for it specifically, definitely exactly how you're asking for it, but then you might even need to step back and even, you know, think about it more broadly. So if somebody say maybe writing about, writing about your business or writing about art, you know, 
taking it that way and then finding yourself in your lane within um, how they're describing it. Like I'm reading a book now and it's about um, the business of expertise. I always read like three books at one time, um, but this particular one, and he's given the example of somebody in a whole nother industry of doing something totally different. Like every example he uses, none of them are about me, but I can see how it applies to me. So if that makes any sense. Um, you answered my question about France. I'm glad your question was answered. Have you reached out to HBCUs, journalism departments? Yeah, so going back to the person looking for um, writers for Black art or Black art writers. Yeah, definitely the HBCUs is a really good place to start too. You can look at other ads for college interns for journalism role. And here's look like another question. There is a Black art gallery in Newark that I plan on visiting this week before their current exhibition is taken down next week. Your creative writing tips will assist me during my walkthrough. Thanks, you're welcome. And another thing to point out too, so we're offering three scholarships with this opportunity of you being in this workshop. So um, send and we'll only choose three, unfortunately. We'll let you know who was chosen and we'll let everybody know once we've chosen the three. Um, three art pieces that we will review, edit, um, and leave any comments for you. So it's like the loving on it. So when you, you know, when you love on something, you tell you what you love about it, what's amazing about it, but then also how it can be made even better. Um, so yeah, we'll choose three people for that. So just email, um, let me see. Uh, I'll send you all another follow-up email after the workshop anyway. So I'll include the email address in there to send your writing to if anybody wanna participate. Um, do you know of any Black art critic asso associations? I do not. Mm, I, I'm not sure if there's even any um, real meaningful art writers <laughs> associations. Um, you know, there are many different industry groups, um, you know, uh, you know, for, you know, writers of, you know, different, you know, demographics or different specializations. And I mean, I think that you could still benefit from a broader writing group that's not an art writers group because you still have, you know, depending what you're looking for, you know, the camaraderie, um, you know, just, you know, being able to share, you know, expose, you know, your work, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you know, we, you can learn from writers who write about different topics for different audiences because you know you're sharing kind of an extension of this conversation um i mean i will I'll, I'll um take a look but i i am not aware of anything like that um you know the art world as we all know you know prides itself on you know being elite and exclusive which is you know one of my primary goals is to dismantle that, you know, myth. Um, I mean, of course, everything's controlled by the one percent at the highest levels, but, you know, the art world itself is is for everyone. Um, so, I mean, I know of many clubs, you know, for artists or people who like art, but, um, you know, I, I I don't think that's what you're looking for. You're looking more for, um, you know, kind of a support system, a community. And you know, if you if you don't find that, maybe you should consider forming one. You know, why not um, reach out to you know folks you know who have you know similar interests and and want to get together. You know, you can start it small. It could be online. You know, you could have you know a basic website where you share resources. You know, if you're, you know, geographically diverse, you can, you know, do Zoom, which we now all are all too familiar with. And, you know, maybe it could expand. I mean, why, why not? Why not start your own? Yep, create what we need. Um, as an emerging artist, how do you create buzz about your work? How do you get people to write about your work without gallery representation? Um, when you keep showing up, <laughs> and you don't quit and you get yourself into people's faces as as best as much as you can and so we have a lot of examples of people doing that through social media um you have people doing that in so many different ways who are still showing up to like uh live painting sessions or they auction off pieces at um even so many like events going on that you know are led by organizations or led by just everyday people. I mean, depending on the city that you're in, especially if you're in Atlanta or, oh my God, or Houston, one of those cities, it's always some kind of, you know, event or some space where you might can get there. I have, I'm trying to think, I don't think an artist has ever explicitly asked me to write about that. And I, 
I wonder if it's, you know, I'm an artist, I'm sensitive about my shish, as if it's that kind of thing. But um, I don't know, as an artist, how do you create buzz about your work? I mean, and two, that goes about, because um, I'm, I'm a writer too, I have to think about that as an artist. So if I think about like my books, right? So if I did this, like this is one of the books that I wrote, Crack Tea. If I think about another book that I wrote, so that was one way of get, creating a more of a buzz about my work. You might've seen the title or, um, I had to think about different like unconventional ways to put myself in front of more audiences. So for example, the last book that I wrote, Crack Tea, this is an oral history. So I had to, I created a poem and I used to go out to the spoken word thing and I would perform a poem. That was one way I created buzz. Um, it's so many different ways. And one thing that I always study too, when I'm thinking about promotion and, and advertising and things like that is I study underground music artists. They are like the best teachers when it comes to like figuring out how to create buzz around your work. <laughs> um, yeah, some really good lessons in that. So like watching like YouTube interviews, like I binge on that. And I really consider it as like a master class. And I just watch it of all of these different artists that kind of just quote unquote made it or they're just really dope and they're underground and they're known and maybe they're not on the mainstream, but a lot of people, you know, they're known and recognized and loved. Um, yeah, just studying how they did that. What were their maneuvers? That's a really good one too. Um, another um, aspect, going back to when somebody was talking about the art writers too, instead of looking for art critics specifically to write about it, because I thought about it when I was talking about history. Um, so I have a his, more so an interest and a passion in history, but that really makes um, a lose for me to write well on pieces that pertain to like time pieces. Um, or pieces that might have like some kind of symbolism that had something to do with something from back in the day. Um, I remember Jacob Lawrence before, like the very first time I seen this piece, which wasn't that long ago, because once again, I just started doing this. And when I saw it, I immediately connected to the Great Migration. You know, I'm just sitting there, I'm talking about it, you know, to, and I didn't even realize like more people had gathered around. I'm like, oh, and I was technically talking about art, but I was more, I was talking about the context of which the piece existed. So that was just something that just came back to my mind. So I threw that back in there. But in terms of creating buzz around your artwork, anybody who have any more um, comments to share on that one, you can throw that in the chat too. Natasha, did you have anything else about creating buzz around your artwork? Yeah, I do get approached um, by individual artists, some who, you know, find my email and, you know, uh, contact me that way. Some who find me on social media platforms that I, I don't really, I'm not really active on and, you know, will ask for an email. And, you know, it, um, a lot of times they're doing a better job than um, the PR people. <laughs> the artists are paying exorbitant amounts of money to pitch because those pitches can be obnoxious. They can be um, completely unrepresentative of what the artist is trying to convey or their work. Um, so I, I just would, um, you know, uh, think carefully about, you know, how you want to describe yourself. I would um, come up with, you know, like a pitch um, that you have that includes, you know, little, you know, basic bio, um, a, a paragraph or two about your work, um, about what particular work or event or exhibition, whatever it is that, you know, you're seeking to promote and, you know, write it in a compelling way and, you know, just say, you know, and, and also it's really helpful to find writers just like, you know, knowing your audience, choose writers who you think would be interested in writing about your work or who you feel know how to convey, you know, work like yours. So, you know, seek them out and maybe say, you know, I really enjoyed your article on, you know, Jennifer Packer. And I was hoping, you know, it, it, there's a lot of ways in. And, you know, be persistent because, you know, um, uh, writers get, uh, writers and editors get a lot of pitches, a lot, a lot, a lot. And we're not ignoring all of them, but obviously the ones that come from people that we have longstanding connections with, you know, we pay more attention to because it's just like something coming into your inbox from a friend or a family member. You're like, oh, I got to check that out to see what's going on. It's not about, you know, prioritizing them because they're better or what they're pitching is better. It's just because you have that relationship, that connection. So you have that, you know, dialogue already. You have that um, you know, mutual respect. Um, but no, just um, be persistent. And yeah, you know, someone else I think mentioned, you know, Instagram reels or Instagram. 
um, many, many, many um, gallery owners that I own, you know, at the smaller and mid-level find their artists on Instagram, the artists they represent. So, you know, that's another thing. If you are seeking gallery representation, I mean, you don't need to and you may not want to, but, you know, that's that's a good way to do it. And, you know, um, you know, check out the types of galleries that you think might be interested in your work that, you know, have similar artists and, you know, maybe even tag them or send them, you know, a direct message. And, you know, I just completed this work from this series and, you know, write, you know, a, a short but um, passionate note. It can't hurt. Sure. You know, the, the worst they can do is ignore you or say no. But always check first their mm -hmm. website and see if they have a submission process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have open like on the on the website. It's at the top call for artists, but you know, some you know you still get the DMs and and then I have to say, well, just go right on over to the website. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah. So this was good. I think that's all of the. Okay. So we have some advertising. Um. So yeah. So that's everything. And if anybody, like I said, so if you want to send your piece, um, your particular art writing, regardless of uh, the direction, the angle, where it's for, who it's for, if you want to send that, you know, we're choosing three people. So please feel free to do that. Thank you for being here. Shout out to all of our Patreon members who made this possible for us to, uh, you know, have professional development workshops like this and not charge you anything to do it. Um, we'll send you a link for a survey and a link to the recording so that you can play it back as many times as you want to and share it with whomever. Um, I, we'll send that over um, before the week is out. You know, we've been saying around the corner, around the corner. So if I tell you to take five minutes, it might take 30 minutes, but it's <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, and so y'all take it easy. Peace. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.